Well, good morning. Good morning. Can I encourage you to sit down and we'll get this session started. And do come forward if you can. My name's Camilla Tolman. I'm the director of IIED. Um, and I'm just going to give a short introduction to this session because it's about agriculture and land, which is very close to the heart of IID's work and, and my heart as well. It's focused on making agricultural investment work for small-scale farmers. And we're very lucky to have a great chair and panel for discussing these issues. Before I introduce our chair, I wanted to just give a brief introduction to IID's work on land and agricultural investment, because as I said, it's been very much at the heart of, of my work and that of IID over the last 20 years. We've been looking at three main areas. One is monitoring large-scale land acquisitions, what's known as the land grab or the rush to acquire soils, water, forests in other countries, in other parts of the world, to try and find out what's actually happening in particular places, to try and get behind the headlines, and to try and understand the principal drivers of this rush to acquire resources elsewhere. The second main area has been working with lawyers and communities and governments to develop effective, low-cost, accessible forms of land rights registration that can secure farmland, that can secure common property resources uh, in terms of access, investment, ensuring returns for the long term. And the third main area of work has been examining and communicating alternative investment models and contracts that keep land in smallholder farmers' hands and get a better balance in market value chains between investors between, and producers. We're really keen to try and address the huge asymmetry in power between big companies, host governments and local farmers. And I know we're going to hear a lot from the panel this morning on how that can work out in practice, what some of the positive examples are, what some of the pitfalls are. I'd now like to introduce our chair, Lindy Wiesabanda, who is a very well-known and respected figure on the global agricultural stage. She's the CEO of the Food, Agriculture and Natural Resources Policy Analysis Network, FANAPAN, based in South Africa. She's been a member of the Montpellier panel and is also on two of the boards of the CGIAR. Somehow she also finds time to have a cattle farm of her own and she's extremely well qualified to run this panel. So Lindiwe, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Camilla, for that warm introduction and the overview on the work you do with a lot of passion. It's a pleasure to be a chair and to be accompanied by eminent, eloquent panelists who are going to be engaging with us for the next one and a half hours. I'm excited because in this panel we have three women and one man. He's a lucky man indeed. But more interesting is that we've got a representative from Brazil, our host country, who is a great advocate on 
farming issues, particularly the family farms. We also have a representative from Africa who is a researcher in her own right and is passionate about forests and ecosystem services. And then big business is also here because the topic that we are on is making agricultural investments work for family farms and for small-scale farmers. Without taking much time, I would like each of the panelists to just give us an overview of who they are, where they come from, what they do, and what it is that made them say yes to be a panelist for this exciting session. I'm going to start with the farmers because as a farmer I'm passionate about the people who feed us. Over to you, Alexandra. Bom dia a todos e todas presentes. É, me chamo Alessandra, sou do Brasil. É, hoje atuo numa organização sindical brasileira que se chama CONTAG, que é a Confederação Nacional dos Trabalhadores na Agricultura. E também hoje é, temos a responsabilidade de organizar as confederações de agricultores campesinos e indígenas em sete países do Mercosul ampliado. E resido, hoje sou uma das agricultoras da Amazônia. E aceitamos esse desafio de estar aqui com vocês para discutirmos principalmente eh, os principais desafios que hoje eh, são colocados para a agricultura familiar brasileira, eh, que é principalmente o olhar eh, como está a disputa no campo e principalmente esse modelo de desenvolvimento que está sendo trabalhado no campo brasileiro e que hoje discrimina enormemente os pequenos agricultores brasileiros. Thank you very much. And then we will move over to Africa. Sarah. I'm called uh, Sarah Namirembe. I come from the World Agroforestry Center. I, I'm coordinating the program for proper rewards for environmental services in ICRAF. And um, my major interest here is to look at achieving uh, environmental integrity in the whole quest for enhancing food production. So looking at ways that we can design land use in a way that, that can achieve both and also achieve fairness for smallholder farmers. So I look forward to a very engaging discussion with fellow panelists and with you too. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. And over to you, Ruth. Yes, my name is Ruth van Eck. Um, I'm a producer of biofuels. We started seven years ago to produce uh, biofuels based on uh, Jatrofa, a crop that grows in Africa. And we decided to, grow Jatro to buy the Jatrofa from smallholders and not to set up a large-scale pl plantation. Um, making that decision um, helped us to, uh, to have more possibilities to grow. But we will come back on that later on. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a few of who is up here, but there are three pillars to this conversation. There is sustainable intensification of agriculture, of course. There is investments, agricultural investments. But most important, there is the small-scale farmer, the family farms, as they will call them here in Brazil. I am keen to understand the typology. What do these family farms look like? Can we bring them to this room? Alexandra, can you take us to the places where you are farming, lift them up and bring them to this room and just describe what does it mean to be a family farmer? What is it that is in a family farm? Esse é um 
começamos o debate por uma identificação importante. É, nós, no Brasil, é, não gostamos muito, nós agricultores, não gostamos muito do termo pequeno agricultor, como em muitas partes do mundo se usa. É, nós hoje dizemos que avançamos para um reconhecimento do termo agricultura familiar, porque entendemos quando se diz pequeno agricultor como se fosse um termo pejorativo, porque é, independe do tamanho da propriedade, porque eu posso ter, às vezes, uma hectare de propriedade e dependendo da atividade que eu desenvolvo, posso não ser um pequeno agricultor. Então, no Brasil, hoje, nos identificamos pelo tamanho da propriedade, é um, um quesito importante reconhecer quem é agricultor familiar, mas, acima de tudo, ele é um, uma, um termo que se utiliza para reconhecer é, a família, é, quem desenvolve essa atividade com a família e, principalmente, é, que trabalha na terra, que tira dela o seu sustento especificamente do manejo com a terra. Então, é esse o diferencial quando dizemos agricultura familiar. E hoje, no Brasil, são mais de 4 milhões e meio de propriedades que representam esses agricultores familiares brasileiros. Apesar de ainda termos uma dificuldade grande é, de identificação das propriedades, um dos grandes problemas é a falta é, de regularização fundiária, não temos o documento da terra, então estimamos esse número que eu estou dizendo de 4 milhões e meio, são os dados oficiais que nós temos, mas são muito além disso, mas sabemos que hoje a agricultura familiar representa e ocupa menos de 20% da exploração do território brasileiro. Então, é uma inversão bastante importante e nossa principal luta é na identificação é, dessas duas agriculturas que existem no Brasil, o seu papel e principalmente o papel fundamental que exerce a agricultura familiar, mesmo estando apenas em 20% do território, garante 70% dos alimentos que vão à mesa de todos os brasileiros, ou seja, garantia da soberania e segurança alimentar nacional. Alessandra, tell us more. You say, one, you don't like the name small, you want to be identified through the family because the core business is to grow food to support the family. You own less than one hectare. What other assets other than land provide for the livelihoods in that family farm? Ok. Bom, esse... Quando nós dizemos que não gostamos do termo pequeno agricultor e que eu dizia que já avançamos bastante nesse termo, hoje no âmbito dos países do Mercosul, nós avançamos e hoje reconhecemos já esse termo agricultura familiar, para além do Brasil. É, se utiliza muito esse termo, inclusive a partir da criação da reunião especializada da agricultura familiar no Mercosul, onde a gente tem avançado nesses termos e nesses debates das necessidades para a agricultura familiar. Então, além também da questão da terra, da identificação do acesso, o primeiro bem para se produzir é o acesso à terra, nós temos discutido principalmente a necessidade de investimento, de políticas públicas que façam um investimento é, que seja capaz de fortalecer a produção da agricultura familiar. Um dos maiores desafios hoje da agricultura familiar, além do acesso à terra, é exatamente a comercialização, a geração de renda e para que a gente possa ter qualidade de vida para essas famílias que sobrevivem nas suas propriedades, terem condição de gerir a sua propriedade e poder também, né, do começo ao fim, né, produzir e também comercializar, dominar todos os espaços de cadeia da sua produção. Então, para isso, investimento em tecnologias e em diversos outros, é, principalmente outras políticas públicas que venham conjuntamente. Nós chamamos, inclusive, esse conceito de reforma agrária integral, porque é o acesso à terra, mas também com um pacote, nós costumamos chamar de políticas públicas que possam garantir tanto a produção, a comercialização, enfim, todas, todas as necessidades dessa família. Thank you very much for that overview on family farms. Over to you, Sarah. Dr. Namirembi, you are a researcher, but you come from Africa. 
we can now visualize what a family farm looks like. Mm -hmm. What does an African small-scale farm household look like in terms of assets, mm -hmm. the number of people who depend on that household, mm -hmm. the physical structures, mm -hmm. and anything else that can help us understand what happens in Africa? Okay, in Africa, what we call a small-scale farm, and we hopefully after today will adopt this family farm term because it sounds much better. But what we call a small-scale farm is usually between one quarter of a hectare, or even less than one quarter of a hectare, up to about two hectares. And this is supporting a family of, on average, six persons. Um, we have these small-scale farms occurring adjacent to urban centers and others occurring in rural areas. Uh, those adjacent to urban centers have good access to markets and can also supplement their income from land with off-farm employment. Whereas those ones from the rural areas um, are less endowed in terms of infrastructure and they produce for family consumption mainly, and in general they are poorer than the, the farms, the small-scale farms in, nearer to the urban centers. The farms usually produce food for the family uh, from cultivation. They have some livestock um, farming. This is usually in the more humid areas we have a mixture of cultivation and livestock. And then in the more dry land areas, the farms are more oriented towards um, livestock. Um, these farms produce the family needs in terms of food. Uh, they can also invest in some form of cash crop production. Um, the environmental services that they may need, things, coming, things from nature, including water or firewood, are usually accessed from the commonly owned patches of land. And um, so usually these kinds of resources are not, are not generated from the, this small-scale farm, but that those resources are generated off-farm from some kind of commonly accessed or commonly owned public um, natural resource system. The land tenure is usually not documented or titled, so a lot of these farms are traditionally or locally known that they are owned by a certain person, but in the more formal system, this, this land tenure is not, is not documented. So it, it's still, it, it's quite unclear from an outsider coming in how the, 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 land, the land tenure works. But, but that's, that's a whole setup of what a small-scale farm looks like in Africa. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that overview. One thing we are getting is that Africa likes the term family farms. So very soon we are going to replace small scale to family farm. Thank you to Brazil. But one thing that's clear is that tenure rights between Africa and Brazil are still a challenge. But for Africa, I think the other thing is that women are the backbone in terms of the food production cycle from these small farms. Now over to you, Rude. We've heard from the farmers, we've heard from Africa, we've heard from Brazil. You are big business. Mm -hmm. What is your interest in Africa? What is your interest in Brazil? What is your interest in these developing, emerging economies? But uh, when I started to invest in uh, Africa, uh, it was in biofuels, and the biofuels business is very new. Um, and for that reason, um, uh, with an upcoming market, you always have to be very careful how to do that. Setting up large-scale plantations for something which is very un unknown, uh, where there's not much information about, is very riskful because you're taking a lot of land away from the, from the people, from the local population, and you're not sure what the outcome will be. So that was the reason for me to decide to work with small farmers. Um, and you can do that in, in, in Africa. You can do that in Brazil, in, uh, in, in Southern America. You cannot do that in Europe because Europe, Europe is, there's no space for production like this, for biofuels and also for large-scale uh, food production because just the continent is too small. So your attraction to Africa 
was the small-scale farms and your interest in improving the livelihoods of these farmers. If I can interrupt you, it's, it, the initial step to go to Africa was to produce biofuels and that we needed the land. My first focus was not to focus on, uh, on, on, on poverty reduction. That is something that came later on because we found out that the combination was very possible. Excellent. I think we get it out of the bag. Big business is in Africa to make business. And business is about profits. It's about win-win. It can be in Africa. It can be in Brazil. I want to ask the farmer. Big business is going into the family farms, is going into the small holder farms to make business. From your experience, are these fair deals? Are they win-win for the farmer and for the investor? I wanted to bring, maybe when you asked before responding, when you brought the fact that we, in the agriculture family, have a lot in common, né? e isso acho que é um principalmente a agricultura familiar da América Latina, a agricultura familiar brasileira e a agricultura familiar africana nós temos é, estado discutindo bastante essa, essas, esses desafios comuns é, exatamente porque também no Brasil mais de 50% dos pobres estão no campo a pobreza no Brasil tem endereço como costumamos dizer e se localiza mais de 50% entre os agricultores familiares no campo, pela ausência também ainda de investimentos à altura. Então, é, esse é um dos pontos, e, e também unifica bastante a nossa ação, quando nós olhamos para a África e o Brasil, e a é, Latinoamérica, são os dois continentes e hoje que sofrem uma maior procura é, de investimento em terras, né? seja pela fertilidade do nosso solo, pela disponibilidade de, de chuva, por espaço, enfim, e também pela falta de uma regulação mais forte das próprias, da, da própria legislação dos nossos países. Então, hoje diríamos que as pautas são muito comuns entre os dois continentes e as necessidades, principalmente de identificação do papel da agricultura familiar e do papel da agricultura empresarial. Como conciliar esses dois interesses é um grande desafio. E hoje, é, diríamos que na nossa experiência, são dois desafios que não se encontram muito fáceis. Eu acho que, principalmente pela diferença de interesses que existem entre os dois setores. Então, é, quando você pergunta, às vezes, essa identificação, o trabalho tem sido justo? É, geralmente, não. Eu acho que, para nós, é parabenizar quando encontramos empresas que estão preocupadas com esse diferencial, mas, em geral, elas não, não se encontram muito fáceis, porque, enquanto uma tem o um interesse de mercado é, e de ganhar, principalmente, de lucros em cima desse mercado, tem uma relação com a terra mercadológica, a, a relação da agricultura familiar com essa terra é diferente, é de inclusão social, é de que a, gente, a nossa luta é para para o empoderamento dessas famílias, para que elas possam é, também aceder, não, não só com a visão é, de grandes lucros, mas, acima de tudo, uma visão de inclusão social. Por isso, os números mostram que a agricultura familiar, ela gera quatro vezes mais emprego em uma mesma hectare, dependendo da, da produção, às vezes, explorada por uma... Uma, principalmente da monocultura. Então, esse é talvez o grande diferencial e nem sempre essa relação é muito justa pela diferença é, de visão e, e de, de objetivos de exploração dessa terra. Thank you very much, Alexandra. When we talking about sustainable development, we looking at the economic benefits, the social benefits, and feeding the environment. And we've got a private sector investor who is working with these family farms, who is working particularly in Africa. His interest is to make a profit because it's business. But Rude, 
what is the formula for making this sustainable development? Can the rural farmers really stand up and say yes to private sector investment, yes to big business, yes to Jatrofa production? Are they winning? <laughs> There is always a, a kind of pressure if, you, uh, if you're talking about uh, large-scale uh, agricultural activities. Very often you, you see the large-scale plantations and they can be very efficient. And that is always in competition with the smallholders because smallholders, small farmers don't, are not that efficient right now. And that is the big competition between the smallholders who are trying to produce their, their food production or trying to produce uh, feedstock for, for other things, could be uh, uh, biofuels, by example. If you have the large-scale production, very often it's more efficient in logistics, uh, in, in fertility for the, for the soil. It's more in control. And it is indeed a very difficult step to, to get those small farmers on the same level as the, as the large scale uh, plantations. For me as an investor, it should be not really uh, an issue. Of course, it is an issue because they are my suppliers, but my price is based on, on what, they, what they provide on me. So, not on the, and if they are less uh, effective, their income is lower. And that is the reason for me that I want them to be very effective. We love your passion for these family farms, mm. for the small scale farmers. But we're still trying to understand. You have articulated the challenges mm -hmm. of making them your supplier. They have diverse interests. They are not well skilled. And the infrastructure support around the family farms is minimum. But you've still chosen to go and do business with them. Yep. Can you tell us why not with big business? We, we, why should you go through this pain? Yeah. It is... What, what we produce is biofuels, and biofuels is a different kind of, uh, of business because it's very new. Um, and that means there's a lot of things are unknown about biofuels. And what you see with large-scale plantations on biofuels, you see that they all get bankrupt right now. The reason is they are unknown about Jatrofa. They started to grow Jatrofa. The productivity is negative, and they have to stop. With Jatrofa, as a side uh, business, if you are just growing Jatrofa as hedges around your land and you, it protects your land and then you can harvest the seeds and sell them to, to a company like Diligent, it's a, different, it's a different approach. It's an additional income without additional effort. So that's a win for Jatrofa. But it only works for now. It only works with Jatrofa. I would like that it also would work with, with food production. So the Jatrofa you have introduced to the African small-scale farmers is providing you with oil with seeds, but yeah. it's, and seeds which you then process. Mm -hmm. But more important, you are allowing the small-scale farmer to utilize marginal land, which they would not use for anything else. Before you answer, I want mm -hmm. to go to an expert. We've got in the panel an African researcher who has an interest in forests, who is interested in ecosystem services, Sarah. Does this make sense? Are we able to reduce poverty in Africa by encouraging our farmers to partner with people like uh, Ruth? Um, I should also maybe uh, put a proviso that in, in certain instances, yes, and the research is still not yet complete on these issues. So we also don't know much more than the private sector on, uh, on how Jatrofa might work if we are going to focus on Jatrofa alone. Uh, but the little research that we have for regarding Jatrofa is the hypothesis was that it would go on marginal land. But uh, it grows faster and quicker if it goes on less marginal land. And so it's beginning because of the, the income that's coming in to the farmers it's beginning to move from what they call marginal land into the land that should have been producing food. Um, so uh, as far as we know about, Jatro that's as far as we know about Jatrofa, but if I could use another example where sugarcane did that, for example, in, in Western Uganda, where with more income, with more farm inputs coming in from the private sector onto the small farm, 
farmers actually completely replaced their food with sugarcane production. And when that, that factory could not buy their sugar anymore, they actually became food deficient. So there, 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 there can't be a risk with that. The assumption that farmers will only use marginal land, I think, should be taken with a, a pinch of salt. I think what's interesting for me is that uh, we admit that research is still work in progress in terms of particularly the Jatrofa. But the beauty with private sector is that they are risk takers. They've gone in, they are partnering with the disadvantaged, and they are also learning by doing. And they are hoping that the policy environment will meet them halfway. Can you just unpack for us, Ruud, the policy challenges that you are facing in your efforts to make sustainable investments through private sector partnering with small-scale farmers? Yep. That, that uh, a just, just a minute. Sarah okay. wants to unpack something. I'll come back to you. Um, I think also the other issue that we need to understand from the private sector is this transfer of risk because there is the issue that, um, that the farmers are taking on this. I mean, as, as much as the private sector is a risk taker, there is also the risk of the farmer. And the insurance systems of the farmers are usually vested in the social networks that they have. And these social networks tend to get kind of disintegrated when they get into partnerships with these kinds of uh, private sector businesses. So I think maybe something else we would like to hear is if the private sector could then compensate that kind of risk that is now exposing, they're exposing farmers to, or you know, can they share in their insurance process? Over to you, Rod. There is the risk. There are policy challenges. What is private sector doing to cushion the small farmers from the risks mm -hmm. that they face? from the policy environment that is not creating a level ground for you to work? Yep. Let me start on the, on the risk side. Uh, what we do, and that is indeed, we, we are sharing the risk a little bit. So we, we, we invest in the, in the factory, we invest in, uh, in infrastructure. Uh, we are not investing in land. Uh, that is the part which the farmer is doing. Um, and that also means that if Jatrofa is less effective, um, the farmer and the farmer is investing in Jatrofa. It means that it could be a disinvestment. That is why we always promoted Jatrofa just to do it additionally. Don't reduce the amount of production for, of food because that is your first part of income. It's, you, you need it for your own living, but you also need it as, as your income. And Jatrofa only should be an additional income. So we always say don't use more than, let's say, 50% of your land. That also makes that it is not possible for us to, to give a kind of insurance uh, if Jatrofa is not successful. Because if, the, um, if, the, if we are suffering, the farmer is suffering. If the farmer is suffering, we are suffering also. It's, we have a common risk and a common profit if it is successful. Then we get a side of policy. And that is something which is very difficult in Africa because we are depending on policies, but there's not much the policy development in, uh, in Africa. What we prefer to do is sell the oil just on the local market in Africa. What happens right now is uh, diesel is produced in, in, in Rotterdam, is, is transported to Africa, is sold there. Also, the oil we are producing is first sent to Europe, to the United States, to produce and to transfer it into biofuels and then maybe sent back to Africa. And, of course, that's ridiculous. I would prefer to sell it on the local markets. The reason we are not doing it is, is because there's no policy. We are not allowed to sell biofuels in Africa. It should not, it's, there's no policy about it. So we don't know what happens if we start selling it right now. Will we later on, over five years, do we have to pay whatever fees? Uh, uh, I don't know. So that's the reason why we don't sell on the local market right now. Interesting. You generate the products in Africa, but you are not allowed to even create the markets where the product is uh, produced. You are making more money outside the continent. Interesting. We could make a better profit if you could sell it on the, in, in the continent itself. So policy challenge number one, we hope you could make both better money, but more important, put more money 
in the pockets of the farmers who are producing. Before I go over to Brazil, roughly show us how much money are we talking about? Because we heard from Brazil that the biggest challenge is poverty. We know that's for sure in Africa another challenge. Now we've got an investor coming into Africa, growing, introducing a crop for biofuel, which is then exported to make big money. My interest is how much of that big money remains in the pocket of the producer, the small farmer. Because food security is about, one, producing the food, two, accessing the food, which means you have money to buy, and making sure you have a decent livelihood. How much money are we talking about on average per year? I can, I can give you some insights about what the income for the farmers is. We always said this is additional. We cannot replace their income. And farmer can make about $300 a year on Jatrova, which makes that they can, in rural environment, they will about double their income. Okay. Um, $300 a, a, a year. In my old life, when I was 13, we, we worked on a maize farm. Mm -hmm. And the maximum we got from our one hectare was two tons of maize. And the current price is about 120 US dollars. So they would normally make about $200 a year. So an additional $300 would really make a difference to a smallholder farmer. It sounds small, but my little mathematics says, yes, it would make a difference. Brazil, since Rude is saying that in addition to 50% of the land being used for crops to feed the family, they are asking for a small portion that they use for biofuels and they leave the farmer with $300 more than they would have without Roots Investments, right? Do you have similar cases in Brazil where you've got big business coming to work with the family farm and making a difference by leaving more money in the pockets of the farmers? Eu queria iniciar, Lídio, pela, talvez pela parte onde nosso companheiro trazia com relação à eficiência das propriedades da agricultura familiar nesse sentido. Acho que é uma prova da, do quanto as políticas públicas, quando elas, elas de fato priorizam o investimento na agricultura, elas fazem uma grande diferença, é, quando eu dizia agora há pouco que a agricultura familiar brasileira, mesmo com as dificuldades que nós ainda temos de assistência técnica, de investimentos, demos passos importantes nos últimos anos, mas ainda tem uma lacuna grande quando a gente vê que mais de 50% ainda são pobres. Mas eu, ela é, eu diria que ela é muito eficiente. Porque conseguir, com todas as dificuldades que tem, alimentar mais de 70% dos alimentos que vão para a mesa dos brasileiros é muita eficiência. Agora, a dificuldade é exatamente que essas políticas nos países consigam olhar para esse setor como um setor estratégico. E isso, acho que, é, nesse debate, principalmente com relação à, à diversificação da produção, à relação, inclusive, da, da maneira de produção para que realmente não seja monocultura, nisso nós nos identificamos. Acho que um dos grandes desafios tem sido como diversificar, como que a propriedade pode também ter várias fontes de renda. Agora, a grande dificuldade nessa relação, quando antes também se debatia que a, como é que se dá essa relação empresa aí com, a, com, a, com os pequenos agricultores, é, ela é difícil porque é, essa relação geralmente, por exemplo, quando é, nós vemos uma terra que às vezes ela é arrendada é, de uma a propriedade para a produção, às vezes pode ser do, de, de água combustíveis ou de celulose, né, plantio de aves para celulose, como no Brasil a gente tem muito, ou, ou várias outras. Em muitos casos, às vezes, são um contratos de 50 anos. A nossa grande preocupação é que o dia que essa terra é devolvida para esse agricultor, ela não vai, ele não vai mais ter condição é, de sobrevivência nela. 
porque ela, ele, ela é devolvida, se for devolvida, essa é uma dúvida também, depois de 50 anos, ele não vai ter condição de dar continuidade, porque a forma de trabalhar também com tantos insumos, com tantas tecnologias e tal, não é a mesma condição do outro agricultor. Então, essa relação, ela muitas vezes acaba sendo de exploração, Agora, ela pode ser uma relação também mais sustentável. Eu acho que quando nós estamos nesse debate, um dos desafios que a gente tem de, é, trazido, principalmente discutindo, por quê? As mesmas empresas hoje, por que sete empresas dominam o mercado da carne mundial, por exemplo? Né? Por que, que muitas, a mesma empresa atua em vários países, como o companheiro aqui está dizendo, atua na África e, e, e comercializa em outros espaços? Às vezes tem a ausência de política pública também para fortalecer mercados locais. Bom, nós, nós também nos identificamos nisso, achamos que a saída é principalmente fortalecimento de mercados locais, para que qualquer que seja a produção tenha foco com o mercado local. E hoje não é o que se potencializa. Então, nós entendemos, principalmente, que acho que essa relação, ela precisa acontecer, é preciso que a garantia de sustentabilidade seja, nós chamamos de rastreabilidade da produção da agricultura familiar, porque, se olhamos hoje, por exemplo, a agricultura familiar brasileira, ela é responsável por uma produção extremamente significativa, por exemplo, do leite. O Brasil é autossustentável em produção de leite, mas... No, a produção da agricultura familiar desaparece quando ela sai da propriedade e chega no laticínio que compra, ela desaparece a contribuição da agricultura familiar. Então nós estamos hoje, é um desafio, a estabilidade dessa produção, eu acho que como que a agricultura familiar está contribuindo nas grandes cadeias, que, de, mesmo do mercado mundial, e hoje esse, a ausência de dados ela é muito significativa nesse sentido, mas nós já identificamos que 28% do que produz a agricultura familiar também faz parte da exportação brasileira. Então, acho que essa relação, ela vai ter sustentabilidade, principalmente, a partir do momento que essa, essa relação de, de identificação, ela acontece. No Brasil, quando você pergunta se nós temos é, experiências parecidas, tem um desafio sendo construído, por exemplo, do biodiesel. O biodiesel na relação com a agricultura familiar, onde se busca tentar também que a propriedade da agricultura familiar também tenha o biodiesel como uma alternativa de renda, mas de empoderamento das próprias famílias, que seja de maneira cooperativa, de maneira conjunta, para que elas possam dominar todos os processos também. E esse é um grande desafio. Né? Então, eu acho que ele é possível, mas não é, bus buscando mercados locais, fortalecendo o mercado local, identificando a real contribuição das famílias, para que elas, de fato, possam se empoderar desses lucros gerados. Uau! Wow. Thank you, Alexandra, for unpacking that and showing us that uh, this policy challenge that private sector is facing is really a major contributor to poverty because if we address that, we could open up new markets and allow our family farms to increase their income. But what I liked is the issue of risk where you say you can diversify by different crops, but by bringing in big business, you are seeing that as a way of diversification because you are bringing in a cash crop that you wouldn't otherwise have a market for. But now with the partnership, you are seeing an opportunity, but it's got to be a fair deal. There is a component of research that you brought in. We go into these deals for 50, 99 years, and this is a family farm. When you get it back after 50 years, can we still call it a family farm? Has research looked into that? Have you done any modeling to project what would be the damage or benefit of giving people like Rud your land to grow cash crops? Then three generations down the line, your grandchildren want to grow cassava. Can they do it? Um, I think what I know about this is not the research coming from ICRAF, but it's research that we did within, um, within Uganda when, when the president of Uganda was, was proposing to give away a portion of the forest to uh, a, a large-scale sugarcane producer. And what we found that actually the long-term 
impacts of using technological agriculture inputs on land causes land to be non-productive in the longer term. So some research has been done, but we, we, I only have the data for Uganda. I'm sure there is data out there for other places. But looking at the Uganda side and also looking at this sugarcane relationship uh, between large-scale producers and small-scale farmers, is that actually that land, if, if the farmers become outgrowers, then la that land becomes non-usable at a later stage. I think something else I also wanted to add to this discussion is the $300 sounds very good um, if you just look at it as $300. But, you know, we have to ask ourselves from whose perspective are we looking at this. And uh, it's the, at the farmers, you, 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 we rarely calculate their investment versus return. So that is something that needs to be a kind of unpacked. And then also there is the issue that we've been looking at this not necessarily for small-scale farmers versus large-scale farmers, but looking at payments for environmental services where this kind of a similar relationship comes in, where we have the larger players from the international market coming in to pay for um, environmental services at the small scale. And again, the question comes in, like how much, how do we set the price which then results into this $300 or whatever it is. And usually the setting of the price from our research in ICRAF is, is, is an issue, really. When you get what the buyer is willing to pay versus what the seller is willing to accept, we found that actually many of the sellers don't, don't get the time to think through their opportunity costs when they're naming their price. And a lot of the times they tend to undersell their, themselves. So the framing of the contracts should actually allow for review to allow the farmers to catch up with these kinds of uh, agreements such that they can renegotiate the $300 or whatever the profit would be. Thank you very much, Sarah. I think one thing that's coming out clear is the issue of trust. When you are dealing with uh, family farms, small-scale farms, and you are bringing a big player to partner with them. There is an element of mistrust in terms of information, the fine print in these contracts, because when I get the $300, I jump and celebrate and say, this is double. But is it the fair deal? Is it, is it really what I got into or that's what I was made to understand is the best value for my output. How do you ensure transparency and flexibility to make sure you can go back to the drawing board should you have a windfall of money? What we, um, it, it took several years before we had uh, settled our price, actually. When we started our business, our price was much lower, and the farmers didn't accept it or they only produce small amounts, and we had to raise the price in time. And at a certain moment, what we found out that farmers get more and more interested to produce jatrofa for us. And that's also something that we always see. If farmers start growing jatrofa for us, mostly it's only a small amount. They only have one row of hedges. And at a certain moment, you reach a level that the trust, that they say, okay, this is interesting. We sold jatrofa seeds to you for two years, and we have trust in the company and the organization, and then they start to increase the production. And that's also why we, it took so many years before we became successful. Um, to build up a trust with the farmers takes a long time. And now we are active for seven years. You see that now at once we see a, a very steep uh, grow of, uh, of, of supply from the farmers. And the reason for it is that we are get, getting more and more well known under the farmers. So we have received, reached that trust. And the reason why we didn't have the trust in the beginning is that a lot of things happened before we arrived at the farm place. A lot of farmers lost a lot of money and, or it started to, with their crops and couldn't sell, uh, sell it finally. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you can see from this panel, small-scale farmers, family farms need big business. They are saying it's not a dirty word, but it's got to be a fair deal. There are challenges in the policy front, 
There are challenges in the governance process, issues of transparency and trust, but this is something that the farmers are welcoming with open arms. I would like to turn over to you and find out from this debate, are there any burning, burning questions and issues that you would want to contribute so that we can bring your views to this debate? We are midway, there is plenty of time, but I just thought I should pause now and open up for your engagement. Whilst you are thinking through your questions, I can see a couple of hands. Alessandra is dying to say something just to top you up with more information. Só para concluir esse bloco, eu queria aqui fazer uma uma We're not yet finalizing. Okay. I want I just want the audience to 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 be part of this dialogue uh -huh. and will still continue. Yeah. OK. Uh, só para uma outra provocação, acho que quando você traz Lídio, é, é necessário de fato essa relação eu queria aqui, até para provocar para o debate, o que nós hoje temos conversado é, através das nossas organizações, tanto aqui no Brasil, através da CONTAG, das outras organizações que trabalham no campo, na América Latina, com as outras redes que nós temos trabalhado também em parceria na África, o que nosso debate tem, tem levado a uma conclusão que nós precisamos nos perguntar se nós precisamos de fato é, desses investimentos de trazer uma, uma produção de que eu não sei lidar com ela de que eu não sei como planta de que eu fico dependente da assistência técnica de que eu fico dependente dos insumos de que eu fico dependente de, de, de todo o mecanismo dessa cadeia de mercado onde o preço desse produto é definido numa bolsa de valor em, em diversos lugares do mundo dependendo do produto qual é, de fato, a necessidade que eu tenho de fazer isso na, na, na minha propriedade? Enquanto agricultora, enquanto é, dirigente, é, a gente tem refletido isso e a nossa conclusão, é, no Brasil temos investido muito mais é, na discussão é, com os nossos agricultores em experiências que, de fato, fortaleçam o mercado local, fortaleçam aquilo que eu já tenho, que produz, que eu sei como lidar, que eu sei como trabalhar, e que, que pode, de fato, fazer uma grande diferença. Um dos exemplos dele, por exemplo, por que não explorar o primeiro mercado que eu tenho mais próximo da minha casa, que é a escola? Foi daí que surgiu o Programa Nacional de Alimentação Escolar no Brasil. E tem feito uma grande diferença de renda nas propriedades e para as famílias, a partir do que ela já produz Fazer que a escola consuma os alimentos saudáveis e que vem da propriedade próximo da sua casa. Essa relação. Então, eu acho que assim, a gente precisa, de fato, essa pergunta, eu acho que como alternativas, elas podem estar sendo buscadas, mas para nós é principalmente fortalecer alternativas de produção, de consumo, que possam estar ali, já com base na experiência do que se tem no local, e aí ir crescendo para outras alternativas, mas, acima de tudo, acho que esse é o caminho para nós mais seguro. É tudo a ver com transparência. Quanto mais o mercado market, quanto mais olhos nós podemos ter em entender o que as forças do mercado são, o que as retenções nos nossos investimentos são, e como podemos se beneficiar e reduzir a pobreza. Another issue is uh, the relationship has got to have some dignity. We need to respect that I'm bringing the land. Don't make me dependent by making me depend on you for the inputs, depend on you for the information, depend on you for the market. There's got to be an element of empowerment so that in this partnership between family farms and big business, you leave the family farm better off, capacitated to do things better rather than be dependent. I saw a couple of questions out there, so please, can we have the mics? Sir, Hello? I'll go row by row. 